can, uh, you can take glass and you can add different things to it, like if you add gold oxide to glass, you get red. Insulators don't come in red. There's only one insulator known, made by Whitehall Tatum, that has been found in kind of a deep red color, similar to that bottle up there. And very few bottles are made in red uh, glass either. So uh, copper oxide and gold oxide in different mixtures can give you the ruby to deep uh, pigeon blood glass color. Put out uh, uh, a, a newsletter every uh, quarterly, I believe it is. And you can join the National Association for about 12 bucks. So if anybody is interested in in uh, connecting up with a little bit more about uh, insulators. We have a national show every year. This year it will be in Sandwich, Illinois. I will be there. And it's, uh, I have been to probably uh, six or seven of the nationals. Uh, and they are really, really exciting to go to. Yes? What's the date on that? Let's say it's really uh, I believe it is uh, July, but uh, I think it's the week after glass plates uh, with uh, cloth soaked in acid in between them, it, it kind of a sticky acid, and the wire ran through these two plates. It prevented it at least from uh, dissipating the, uh, uh, the wires themselves. If they lose the power, it uh, by connecting up with the pole, it will go down and into the ground and, and disappear. So they had to protect the wires from losing the power, otherwise they only could uh, send electrical current or a telegraph message maybe a mile or two, the earliest ones. And so they had to find really good quality insulation for that. Glass turned out to be the best, and they, that's exactly what they started with. Um, about uh, 1849, is when the telegraph was just starting to take off. They uh, found that it had great use in terms of uh, uh, letting people know that there was a train coming. And so along the railroad lines is where they, uh, they were. And of course, uh, during the Civil War, communications became extremely important, instant communication. You needed to know where battle movements were, and so uh, a lot of the insulators, that's when they, when they started to really uh, produce uh, great quantities. Now, uh, some of the oldest ones, of course, did not have threads in them. And I have a few of the extremely early insulators. This one is not complete. It has a finish on the book. This was a tree insulator, and they wired it to a tree. The uh, glass came up like this and then there was just a slot and they slid the wire down in it and then there were little catches on it so that it wouldn't bounce out of there. But these uh, were made by the Cutter Glass Company. They were, uh, or maybe the, uh, uh, the patent was Cutter. And uh, this one was just hooked up to a tree and you could get very quick communications and they would throw the wire on as the, uh, as the military was moving through an area, they could string up uh, wires in real short order with something like that. Then, uh, uh, going, as they started to move west, they needed to go long distance, and they needed some more secure, permanent types of insulators. So they came up with, uh, this one of course has no threads in it, so there's nothing to hold it on, they just hammer them onto the pole and just bang. And of course, when they tried to get them off, they had to hit them with a hammer on the other end, and so almost all of them are damaged along the bottom. Almost all threadless insulators that you find are going to have some damage along the base. This is called a wade. It's a very thick piece of wood that uh, was on the peg there. And then this was inserted into a wooden cover shaped like a beehive over the top. And then the wire was tied around this wooden cover. I have seen uh, almost perfect condition wades with the wooden cover. And they, they're about a $1,200 item. I don't happen to have uh, the wooden cover for this. Uh, this one I bought on Klingen Smith's auction, and he also sells bottles, as you know. But uh, this is what probably goes back to the 1850s, early 60s. 
so they came up with this mechanism. It's a, a, a block of wood. It's got the original square peg nail in it. And at the bottom is what they call a ram's horn. And you can see why. It has a curl in it. If I put a wire in here and put a little bend in it, it'll snap down into there. And then when the tension is on it, it won't pop <coughs> out of there. And so uh, ram's horns are uh, some of the earliest, about <coughs> 1860, 59, something in that nature. And then they decided that to uh, that this uh, uh, kind of uh, gutta percha or whatever is in here, they replaced that later on with glass, and they used them for about 10 years. These were used uh, mostly locally uh, for short distances. They weren't uh, a great insulator. I'm not sure, but it's probably in the Smithsonian today. Uh, I told my students about that, and they said, well, let's go out and see if we can find it. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it, uh, it's certainly uh, in some historical place. This insulator came from that line. Oh, this cool. has uh, um, UPRR on the back. It uh, uh, was hammered off. It was found in a, in a stagecoach station dump in Rollins, Wyoming. And that uh, some guy dug out uh, several hundred of these. There were only uh, a handful, however, that were in the cobalt. And I happened to get one of these. Uh, it, uh, uh, unfortunately, it's not in very good condition. I had a trailer fire in 1972, and I lost a big portion of my insulator collection. They came in with the hose, they hit my hot insulators, they just shattered. This one, fortunately, only cracked across the top, and I glued it back together again because it's, uh, it's a prized uh, possession of mine. But this is threadless from about 1869 uh, or 70, and then uh, from that point on, then uh, they didn't have too many of these. These were uh, hammered onto the pole. Sometimes they put sort of a sticky glue substance on it to hold it. But uh, uh, the main one was put on, if you can, you can notice that there's kind of a cloth look to this peg. This is an original threadless peg that was soaked in sulfur uh, and canvas was put over the thing, and then when they put hammered it on, the, uh, the cloth expanded inside, and it held the insulator fairly closely. Occasionally, they would pop off, and so they needed something to hold them on. This is the insulator, supposedly, that uh, came with that. So this is a threadless insulator. Threadless insulators start at about 100 and, and go on up into the tens of thousands. So. Uh, I, if anybody ever comes across one of these, let me know. I'd like another one. They only sell for 10, 15 bucks, but you never see them. So I'd like to have another one. Uh, back when you were kids on the farmer's pole, and there was one here and one here sticking out like that, and they, they actually uh, they screw down on there like that. And you can hand thread uh, these pegs, and that's often what they did. They took the old wooden pegs and they had a machine and they would just, uh, you know, uh, screw down on it and they would they re-thread it, a lot of them, and of course, uh, they still, to, to this day, there are a few insulators still sitting up on the threaded pegs. Now, uh, I'm, what I'm going to do in the house. Now, if lightning hit that, what happened to it? What happened to the lightning? It had to be grounded, but it, it couldn't touch the wood or the shingles or anything else. So they had to have an insulator. These are insulators. Uh, this is this one is patent dated 1851. Give you some idea how long ago they were put together. This one is what they call teal green. It's uh, a real pretty green color, made by the uh, the uh, inventor of Otis. And so this sat up on the barn. I'm not exactly sure how they worked, but they usually had sort of a, a metal clamp of some kind that attached. And then the, I don't know if the cable went through there or exactly how they worked. Um, to get that color, it's mostly iron. How many have seen uh, those early wine bottles from the 17 and 1800s? What color are they? 
green. They're almost black. Yeah, they're so dark and green that they're almost black. Why are they almost uh, always greenish color? I, because what did they you suppose they heated up the sand in? Iron. An iron cauldron. And after they, the, the first bottles that came out were maybe a light green. And as they heated them hotter and hotter and, and they dug out more and more of the glass, it got down toward the bottom and the iron would actually get into the glass and it would cause it to turn darker and darker to almost what they call black glass. That uh, dark green, of course, uh, is iron oxide from, uh, uh, from the cauldron itself. And they didn't like that green color. Everybody wanted clear glass. So they came up with uh, the idea using uh, optical chemistry that if they were to add traces of manganese dioxide uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the glass itself, what happened was the, the prism would combine and they would end up with a full spectrum of light coming through. So it, it eliminated the color coming through only in the blues and greens, and it allowed more different colors to come through. However, manganese dioxide, and I'm sure you don't remember your high school chemistry maybe well enough to remember, there is a, uh, a transformation from manganese dioxide into something called permanganate. Have you heard of that? Permanganate is the uh, sun-produced ion that comes from manganese uh, added to the glass. And when they, the sun sits out, beats down on it for years and years, if you take some of your bottles that you've got in your collection and you stick them outside for a while, you might be surprised how many of those would turn to a, a, what they call sun-colored amethyst, a purple color. And some of them get pretty dark. And I can prove it to you that it's the sun that's doing it. Here is a uh, lightning rod insulator that was uh, clamped to the side of a barn <coughs> many, many years ago, and the sun beat down on it and turned it purple. However, under the clamp, oh, it's clear. Very cool. So, uh, originally the whole thing was that particular color, and the, uh, the sun did that. Now that insulator that you see there is uh, cobalt blue, the one on the far your right. Uh, that is a, uh, an insulator that came from Belarus, uh, probably made in Russia or Poland, we're not sure. But uh, this is what cobalt blue looks like. Uh, it, if, if you put large numbers of it, well, large amounts of it in there, it gets darker and darker until it's almost black. This next one is a Minnesota insulator. We were fortunate to have these on uh, the Sioux line. There was one of these on virtually every pole. This is one of the most expensive and most sought after insulators that you can find. And, and I'll bet you that you have uh, people in here that have uh, run across these. This is called Peacock Blue. It has a, a little bit of the uh, iron in it now because there is less blue and it's starting to get a greenish tinge to it. It's hard to see perhaps, but this has got a little bit of green in it now. As you add, uh, take away blue and add more green, you get what's known as uh, blue aqua. And then you get the traditional aqua color. This insulator comes from California. It's from the 1870s. And these are extremely sought after insulators. Uh, they're made by the Electrical Construction and Maintenance Company of San Francisco. And everybody wants uh, an ECNL. So uh, these uh, sell for two to 250 in decent shape. And again, uh, they were brittle glass. Uh, they all tend to have some damage on them. Adding uh, more and more of the green from the iron and less of the blues from the copper and the cobalt you get, uh, this one is referred to as probably a true green. You get uh, next to it is the 7-Up green, very much like the uh, Hauenstein bottle over on the side. And then going more and more to the greens and adding uh, yellows, you end up, this is uh, referred to as yellow green. Taking away more blue, you get 
um, olive green. Now, do bottles come in olive greens very often? Oh, yeah, peas are not peas. Some of them do. Okay. Yeah, I don't see too many green bottles, especially in this uh, this olive green. Uh, I see an occasional one, maybe in the Seven Up. Uh, going uh, coming this way, these are Canadian insulators. Uh, they have little diamonds on them. They're referred to as ponies. Any small insulator uh, that uh, was probably used on a telephone line, in a rural telephone line, low voltage, are referred to as ponies. And so all, all your ones, they have a single skirt on them, on the bottom. They, uh, these were made in Canada. They, uh, there are people that collect nothing but the diamonds. There's a diamond on each one, and it's uh, one of the uh, specialty collectors. Uh, there's a book that comes out just on the diamond ponies. Going farther, this is uh, yellow olive green um, with a tinge of mustard, and then you get into this mustard yellow color. These get very expensive. Uh, they're in the uh, four to $700 range when you get into the true mustard colors. And finally, the, all the blue is gone, and we're down here with yellow amber. I don't know if I've ever seen a bottle in this this uh, bright yellowish uh, yeah, yeah, amber color. Yeah, there are some, maybe, right. some yeah. maybe some historicals are yeah. in that. Uh, and bitters. Vinegar. Yeah. 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 Are they quite rare? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, near the chemist, there's a story that the sun colored amethyst, it's a manganese. 3,000 overnight. So um, that, uh, that, of course, the milk comes from zinc. Zinc oxide that's put in the glass. You get kind of a, a white milky appearance. And I know that uh, milk glass is common in, in bottles as well. There's a company, uh, one of the earliest the big companies out east was the Brookfield New York Glass Company. And Brookfield probably was the second largest producer of insulators in America. They, they made uh, insulators that were. Uh, uh, very structurally strong, they lasted pretty well, and they were pretty cheap. Now, uh, I uh, have a group of insulators here that are referred to as Krebs. Crown Embossed Brookfields, C-R-E-B, Krebs. So if you see any insulator that has markings up here, you might see the Brookfield name on there. This is the one that comes in the amethyst color. Uh, I found this one out uh, east, or west of Fargo. This one is lavender. It's kind of a grayish uh, lavender tinge to it. Uh, and these are very expensive. They're, they're uh, quite much rarer than the purples. Uh, then they uh, also, this one is called light sapphire blue. And then uh, they come in the, uh, the yellow green. Now, uh, I'm going to uh, shut the much prettier than then the, uh, uh, I, I don't like, uh, fluorescent isn't always true, but sunlight is hard to duplicate, so uh, this is probably about as close as we can get. Then the, uh, there was a, a company called the Chicago Insulating Company. They made an insulator that had, instead of having a groove around it, it's a series of diamond shaped parts. The reason they made them, I understand, is that they had these projections here which, if receiving a blow, wouldn't shatter the insulator. They would just bust off a little piece, uh, preserving the insulating quality. So the, these are called, uh, referred to as a Chicago diamond because of the shape of the grooves in there. This one has a, this one has a tadpole on the top. I don't know if you can see it or not. What year was that one you're talking about? This one? Um, was that what this, you were just talking about? Yeah, this is a Chicago diamond. Yeah, yeah this uh, this was probably made around 1885. They were found on the Highway 169 line going north of the city. So, uh, there's a few of them there. I ran across this for a dollar in a junk shop. <laughs> Very fortunate. Yeah. Um, this particular insulator 
is quite scarce. It's a pony from California Electric Works. I don't know if you can see the CEW on the uh, embossing. Uh, uh, one of the uh, real rare sought after ponies. This pony has uh, a double groove. A lot of times what they did uh, in the rural areas, they needed two lines coming off from, from one peg. And so they would have one wire coming here, then they would have a drop line that would come around here, and that would come to the farm. So they would have uh, use what they call a barrel insulator, or keg is another name for these with, with double grooves on it. Ohio Valley Glass Company. They also made bottles, by the way. I don't know if they, they're embossed OBG or not. Uh, here's an unusual style where you can see the double groove uh, is near the top. One of these from, from Australia. They're made by the AG Glass Company. It says AG on there. This one is referred to as the doorknob. Uh, it has a, a wide groove. I'm not exactly sure what they used them and how they used them uh, with that big wide groove on there, but uh, maybe it was for fast replacement or something. Um, this is a Canadian insulator. That one probably has the selenium that this gentleman was referring to. Uh, selenium gives you this straw uh, coloring to it. And then, of course, uh, chromium was used as another, as another coloring agent. Chrome comes from the word color. Chromatic means colorful. And so uh, when you use chromium, uh, they used to spray that on the outside. This is called flashed glass. The uh, chromium does not go all the way through the glass. And you get this amber just on the outside called flashed glass. If they used uh, smaller amounts of chromium, it didn't turn brown, it turned into what we refer to as carnival glass. The reason it's called carnival glass is that you didn't win teddy bears back in 1930 when your great-grandfather took great-grandmother to the fair and they won something, they would get a vase or a plate and it would be uh, carnival glass. This one here is, you'd never guess what this one is called. Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse. <laughs> now that's, uh, that's for heavier cables. And then of course they tie them around like that. There was uh, a need out west for insulators and instead of sticking up on the pole, hung down from the beams. Where do you suppose that was? Yeah, tunnels. Yeah, and tunnels or mines. And so this is what they came up with. They came up with an insulator that was threaded uh, all the way through, and then they would, uh, you know, screw it up from the bottom and then put the wire on there. Here's a, what they call a double transposition. If you were riding along and you get static on your radio, the reason might be that the telegraph lines produce an electromagnetic field around the wire. That's how motors are produced. Well, to prevent that, what they would do is they would run the wire here, and then on the next pole, they would drop it to the bottom of one of these insulators. And so it would go like this, and the wires would switch places, thereby disrupting that magnetic field, and it would eliminate some of the static. And then, of course, they uh, this is Canadian also. These are some of my favorites. These are the Canadian diamonds. I ran across this one uh, last summer up in an antique shop in uh, Canada. And uh, this is a particularly rare one. It's extremely light amethyst. I'm looking for a bottom for this. If I can find a match for this one, uh, I've got about a $400 uh, pair. And this one's a little bit darker. Uh, and then they just, the peg like that, and they just screw them on together. Of course, uh, um, this is a color that I don't think uh, many bottles were made in. 
Uh, this is referred to as opal or opalescent color. And I believe that's nothing more than zinc oxide that's put in the glass. But they only put a light amount of it in there so that it, it uh, reflects color in different ways like a miniature prism. And so that's why you see that uh, color effect. Who, who made that? Uh, do you know? Unfortunately, mine isn't isn't dent. <coughs> it's uh, got the damage that's on the bottom. But this is the ECNM. They were used all across uh, California, <coughs> Washington, Oregon, and Arizona, and they are uh, still trying. You know, people are, they're digging around holes and coming up with some of these. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was a rare insulator found by digging around a hole about. Uh, months ago and it was pictured in the latest crown jewels uh, it's about an eight to ten thousand dollar portable insulator but this one has got some damage on it but uh, if you were to go out uh, and find insulators that have been lying in the ground since maybe 1950 the, when they threw them down on the ground uh, that's uh, most of them would probably have about this much of the insulator sticking out as the grass, oh. it actually turns to soil. Oh. And then, of course, you get stuff blowing in and everything else. And so I have found insulators that are almost completely submerged. I suppose when they get rained on, they even you know, can sink down in the pump. So you suppose to show the different, uh, different chess pieces. Uh. And of course, this one goes in the corner. But uh, <laughs> if you get one of these, you got to spend $1,000 for each corner. Yeah. Mine isn't quite that expensive. It lost some of its porcelain. It was dipped into the uh, glaze, and then they were set like this, and so they don't have any glaze on the top of the insulator. I don't know why they got by with that, because I would think that after a while, without any uh, protection from the elements, you're going to get some damage done to the top, or maybe some uh, loss of insulation quality. But uh, this one goes back about 1885. That insulator. And this one, I have a number of them from different countries. This one was brought back by a friend of mine from Saudi Arabia. And I left all of the mud and uh, dirt. There's that Saudi Arabia dust inside there. And some sort of tar or paint or whatever they use. I don't know how it got that on. Oil. Oil. Maybe it's oil. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that, uh, that of course is. Uh, not particularly valuable, but it's uh, very valuable. To and, uh, two of mine uh, were there on display. So Northwest Insulator Club. Actually, it's supposed to be Northwestern, but uh, I was uh, uh, the last day I was in uh, Germany, and we were staying with some people over there, and they uh, wanted to keep in touch. And uh, his name was Gunter, and I said, uh, you know, Gunter, he took us out to, uh, uh, said, do you know where the, uh, the old Iron Curtain used to be? Oh, yeah, he says, that's only a few miles from here. It's uh, kind of on the border of Bavaria. And he took us down there, and there was a section that they left from the original Iron Curtain. And they've got the fence up for, oh, maybe 30 feet or something like that. And they got the barbed wire on it. And there's a, a cement trench and so on, you know, that made it difficult for people to scoot across. And on the top of the line, there was barbed wire with electricity. And here were some insulators sitting up there. Now, of course, I wasn't going to shinny up there and uh, damage history. But I said, Gunter, if you ever run across one of those insulators, I want you to uh, get it for me, and I'll pay you whatever you need to, to have for it. Well, about uh, two weeks ago, I get a package in the mail. And this is an insulator. It's probably the only one in the United States. But this is an insulator from the top of the iron curtain. Wow. He went up there, huh? <laughs> 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 yeah. he, he said he, said he, he bought it from, uh, I, much as I could read his uh, German, uh, he said it sounds like he bought it at some company that uh, had scrap metal or you know, collected that kind of thing and yet they're across it. Wow.